sixth annual Oxford Economics of Mutuality Forum. We have over 3,000 participants registered for this year's event, joining us from 98 different countries. Thank you for being here and contributing your thoughts, your energy, and your commitment to this movement. My name is Amanda Catherine Roman, and I'll serve as the Master of Ceremonies over the next three days, during which we will discuss, debate, and imagine new ways to put purpose into practice for this decisive decade. Today, we will talk about leadership and what needs to be activated and elevated to accelerate the transition to stakeholder capitalism. Tomorrow, our focus will be on performance management, and we will discuss how frameworks and metrics contribute to holistic value creation. And then on Thursday, we will turn our attention to the evolving systems of investment to learn from pioneers who are building new infrastructure to support mutual financial flow strategies. This forum is one of the many places where current and future leaders are connecting and finding new ways to solve old problems. As you will hear from our incredible speakers, the social, private, and public sectors are finding ways to work together to re redefine what success in business looks like, and then looking for ways to rewire their operations to provide opportunity and agency for team members to contribute to increase social impact. Together, we can build a world that works for everyone. To kick off our conversations, I'd like to welcome Paul Pullman, who is no doubt well known to this audience. Paul is the chairman of Said Business School, and he works to accelerate action by business to achieve the UN global goals, which he helped develop. He was the CEO of Unilever from 2009 to 2019, the co-author of the brand new book, Net Positive, How Courageous Companies Thrive by Giving More Than They Take, and has been described as Financial Times as a standout CEO of the past decade. Welcome, Paul. Well, thank you, Amanda, for the kind introduction as well, and good to see you again. Yes, absolutely. I'll, I'll um, be there and kick it off then as well uh, after your introduction. I'm honored to be here as a co-host to kick off this forum, obviously also with my two other friends. I believe it's in its sixth year right now and doing that together as well with Colin Meyer and uh, Bruno Roche. And later on, after some introductory remarks, I certainly look forward to a discussion with my dear friend, uh, Mark Benioff, who, as you well know, is the co-founder and, and capably, capably running uh, Salesforce right now. Also, a lot of appreciation for the uh, economics of mutuality. And as you mentioned, the uh, Oxford uh, University Side Business School, where I have the honor uh, right now to serve as the chair. But thanks to you guys for uh, organizing this incredibly important forum. Over the next three days, it's quite exciting to explore, explore the theme of putting purpose into practice for this decisive decade of action. And decisive decade of action it is. We frankly don't have any time to lose anymore. Broadly, we know what needs to be done, but we need to focus on accelerating at speed and scale. And we have a great list of thinkers or speakers to discuss, as uh, Amanda was saying, the future of leadership, where it all starts. It's so crucially important that it starts with ourselves. But then the future of performance measurement, how do we get the right frameworks to help us accelerate it and then get the money to flow, which is the future of investment? Nothing will happen if we don't get the money at scale to flow in the right direction to create this more sustainable, equitable or inclusive future that we all aspire to. I couldn't say it better than my friend Colin, who already has said that the purpose of business is to create profitably solutions to the problems of people and planet. It is not to profit as we call it, from creating the world's problems, but to actually solving the world's problems. Over the next few hours, we'll talk about the leadership model needed to make this a reality. And that's probably the most important thing, I think, that hopefully we can leave you with and a few lessons as we go along. It is clear to most of us that business as usual is no longer sustainable. Every sector I would argue is affected by the challenges that the world is facing, and we're familiar with them. It is a, a global economic system, frankly, that is broken. We've shown once more with COVID that we can't have healthy people on an unhealthy planet, that we can't have infinite growth on a finite planet. And frankly, anything we can do infinitely is by definition unsustainable. This year, World Overshoot Day, 
which is the day that we use up more resources than the planet can replenish, was July 29th, which means, frankly, that after that day, we are stealing from future generations. In other words, we're living well beyond our planetary boundaries. And COVID has shown us the complexities of our economic systems, but also its interrelationships, biodiversity, climate change, the economy, human health, was the tragic death of George Floyd, the racial dimensions, all closely correlated. And frankly, with COVID shining a magnifying glass on it, not doing as well as we had expected. Not surprising that we hear 95% of the CEOs say, hey, we don't actually want to go back to where we came from as we design out of COVID. We want to go back to something that is better, that works for everybody. Unfortunately, our societies are being pulled apart. On every measure, be it inequality, be it poverty, or be it injustice, we see in so many countries and communities a situation that was already bad before the pandemic, but actually has ex been further exaggerated. I would argue that on the sustainable development goals, the pandemic itself, from a poor starting position, has already pu pulled us back probably by another 20 or 30 years. It wouldn't be so bad if we had a political system and a global governance that would go into overdrive and help us solve it, like we've seen in many times in the history of mankind. But unfortunately, our political system is stuck. Too many national governments paralyzed by self-interests, populists, nationalists, or xenophobics, a result, frankly, of not addressing these issues in the first place. Likewise, our global governance structure is equally at a very difficult time in its history and unable to bring solutions fast enough to these shared uh, challenges. For evidence, I would say look no farther than the unequal distribution and unfair distribution of vaccines, where we have nearly 70% of the developed world vaccinated, but less than 7% of the emerging markets. We see the same on the recent climate negotiations in Glasgow, where we still have not don't have the audacity or the courage, if you want to, to muster up the 100 billion climate fund to help countries, frankly, transition on an issue that they were not very much part of. So time is running out. The IPCC has confirmed, frankly, that we don't have until 2050 to take actions on our most burning issue of climate change. In fact, we don't have till 2040. And I believe that the real deadline is really 2030. This is therefore called the decade of action. And we all know that the ambitions that we need to set need to go up. Although Glasgow, the COP26, where I was happy to be present for two weeks, is, is uh, uh, one snapshot and should not be judged by that. We should really look at the longer term movie. But it is fair to say that politically, perhaps Glasgow over delivered a little bit, but scientifically, we're still under delivering and far removed from the 1.5 degrees that we can afford. The good news of Glasgow is that we, unlike what we thought when COVID came, that countries would go back to uh, the shorter term actions, that, gov that companies would forget about ESG and go back to short term behavior. Much of what we saw during the financial crisis, the opposite is actually true. I think Glasgow has shown us fast forwarding 18 months since COVID, that we now have 65% uh, of the countries, 90% of the emissions uh, covered by net zero commitments. That used to be 20%. We now have half of the financial market making commitments to be net zero in their portfolios with the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero. And yes, we had 5,000 of the biggest, most important companies making strong commitments with the uh, race to zero or race to zero breakthrough. We also saw nature coming in to the debate, which is very important. We saw the countries being recommitting to the one and a half degrees, pointing out coal, methane or fossil fuel as being the ones, the issues that we need to get rid of, a first in the history of mankind, starting to recognize our responsibilities on loss and damage, launching the sustainable standard board. And yes, being clear that it is not just words that count, but actions and holding ourselves accountable, hopefully, with an annual review, the next one starting in, in a year's time when we come together again 
in um, Egypt. So all of all, a mixed picture where we've bent the curve in Paris from four degrees to three degrees, in Glasgow from perhaps three degrees to closer to two degrees, and now with higher ambition, faster action, more accountability, we have to get to the one and a half degrees. Almost everybody now accepts that business cannot be on the sidelines. I've often said that business cannot uh, succeed in societies that fail, but it can also not uh, stay on the sidelines of a system that gives them life in the first place. We do need business now more than ever as a force for good to address these issues and address these issues at speed and scale. The simple thing is not to get all excited about having the whole industry change, but bringing these leaders together that create these tipping points in their sectors and then giving our politicians the confidence to be even bolder and ambitious in setting the national targets. Ultimately, we need the governments to lead in this way, but we need to encourage them to lead in the right way and with the speed and skill that is needed. We've shown with COVID a very important thing, that the cost of inaction is actually becoming higher than the cost of action. We spent $17 trillion on saving lives and livelihoods. The IMF estimates that the global GDP has taken a dent this decade of $27 trillion. These numbers are infinitely higher, call them the cost of failure, than what we would need to spend to implement the sustainable development goals and avoid these issues in the first place. Study after study has now shown that running your businesses with this longer term multi-stakeholder model, putting purpose at the core um, of, of, of your organization also produce better results. This has become even starker uh, during COVID. And indeed, many companies are moving in that, uh, that right direction. We just need to help them be a little bit faster, be a little bit tougher with the targets that they set and indeed drive these broader systems changes. And that is not easy to do. That's why we think it's right to reframe the debates to what is called net uh, positive, the title of our book, How Courageous Companies Thrive by Giving More Than They Take. I think to go to the next era of capitalism, we need to rethink uh, business is very purpose. And that's really what the essence of the book is about. The net positive force for good is really creating a mindset where business can profit from solving the world's problems, not creating them. Where we want to move people out of the CSR sphere that we still see too many companies in, even in Glasgow, of which is less bad. Less bad simply isn't good enough anymore when you have July 29th as World Overshoot Day. So um, it's like, uh, I hate the comparison, but I'm a murderer. I used to kill 10 people. Now I'm only killing four. I'm a better murderer. It just doesn't work anymore. Embedding purpose in a corporate strategy, I believe, has now become a precondition of being a successful company. And then that's not enough to be a successful company. I also think that successful companies increasingly will participate in accelerating this move to this next era of capitalism and drive the broader systems transformations. Now, we understand that there is no systems transformation without individual organizational transformation. And I would argue there is no individual organizational transformation if we don't drive the individual leadership transformation, moving from a competitive form of leadership to a collaborative form of leadership. This is as much a leadership uh, transformation as a systems transformation. Someone pointed out to me once, rightfully so, that the issues that we're facing are actually not climate change or inequality or food security. At the end of the day, we're dealing with an issue which is called apathy, selfishness, and greed. And that can only be answered with that higher level of consciousness or that higher level of leadership we're going to talk about. As I mentioned, the book is really about starting a movement for change to help transform these companies and the leaders from inside out. We are learning from ongoing evidence that this long-term focus of running these businesses and putting purpose at the core, that it actually pays out. In fact, Just Capital has published numbers that show a 47% higher uh, return and obviously stronger market capitalization. Uh, capitalization. It is just it's a smarter business strategy. 
we're now starting to see even by sector, if you look at the work that has been done by the weighted impact accounts, and you'll hear from um, from uh, the people that are working on that in, in parts of the sessions from George, that uh, companies that more aggressively attack these negative externalities, even within their own sectors, are already being higher valued by the market. So what some people start to talk about still or debate as immaterial issues or hard to quantify, the smart people in the financial market are already uh, factoring them in. The book has laser focus on the how. We don't think we have to spend any more time on the why we're doing this. The science is clear. It's actually fully aligned with the vision of the economics of mutuality and the research that is happening in the side business schools. It provides companies with metrics that are designed to be simple, to be pragmatic, to be actionable, and, and that businesses can understand. It's not written by academics or consultants in due respect, but by someone who has run a major public company over the last uh, 10 years. But it basically shifts the definition of CSR, corporate social responsibility, to what I call RSC, becoming responsible social corporations. And that is really what we all need to strive to. So the CEOs that are leading these companies is where we need to start and to end. There's a simple question that is the world better off because your company is in it or not? How can you as a company take full responsibility for all your social and environmental impacts, well beyond scope one and two, intended or not, and being consistent with everything you do, building that trust and unlocking that partnership and transformation that is needed. And this is why trust is important. I still see too many companies making commitments of scope one and two, outsourcing their value chain, not getting really responsibility for scope three. They think you can outsource your value chain and also outsource your responsibilities. Net positive companies don't accept that. Net positive companies also serve all of the stakeholders, including your staff, your customers, your suppliers, but more importantly, the next generation and the planet as well. Driving longer term value creation has to benefit all of your stakeholders and will ultimately as a result benefit your shareholders. They understand that you need to embrace these deep partnerships, that these issues are of such magnitude, you can't solve it alone, including the working with governments, your critics, your competitors. Because frankly, as I've said many, many times, we should not compete anymore on the future of humanity. If the ship sinks, that narrow self-interest won't save you. We all will go down. So the book then talks to some of the tougher challenges in the that we deal with. We call them the elephants in the room because it is about that consistency in all we do. It is about action speaking louder than words. How do we deal with tax, with corruption, with human rights, with CEO salaries, with money in politics, with letting trade associations loose, advocating different things than what we personally uh, are committing to. So ultimately, it is about how you transform your organization it's about how you transform your culture, how you engage your employees, how you galvanize that shared sense of purpose, how you increase that engagement, that loyalty, and ultimately that productivity. I don't pretend it's easy. Unilever certainly wasn't perfect either. I don't think anybody is yet. But increasingly, we see companies putting themselves on this path to net zero. And I hope that reading the book, you'd actually be uh, enticed to accelerate your own path as well. Companies like Microsoft making commitments to take uh, carbon out of the air since their origins in 1975. Companies like Nestle or Unilever uh, making commitments to have 50% or more of their sourcing in regenerative agriculture. Walmart protecting a million square miles of oceans. Or technology coming in like interface with tiles or the construction industry was um, cement that is actually absorbing carbon instead of emitting carbon. These are the signs of, um, of net positive, but now we need to obviously have that consistently everywhere. But ultimately, once more, and this is where I want to end, it boils down to leadership. Because if the leaders don't find their own purpose and their courage, they will never set the targets that are needed. They will never work 
uh, by taking responsibility for their total impact. They will never get into these broader partnerships, which at times are uneasy. So the human transformation is at the roots once more of all of this. There was a um, Iranian poet, uh, Rumi, in the 13th century that I always like to quote because he probably put it better than everybody else when he said that yesterday I was clever, so I wanted to change the world, but today I am wise, so I'm changing myself. And I think that's the spirit of net positive, working up the personal, then the organizational, and then the systems level. I greatly once more admire the work of the economics of mutuality and what the side business school is doing. I do believe it's good to point out that business schools and the academic institutions will be an incredibly important partner in creating these net positive business models and mindsets. Right now, it is fair to say that our MBA programs in most of the schools are a carbon copy of Milton Friedman on steroids, and we clearly haven't created the right leaders. So if we cannot achieve um, this transformation in leadership, uh, or if we want to achieve this transformation in leadership, we need to do that with the professors, the students, the deans, the researchers, all together. It requires higher education to reimagine their purpose, their role in the post-COVID world, and actually become stewards of a more inclusive uh, economy. It requires them to partner differently with business, with the right parts of business and civil society actors to embrace the net, uh, the net positive mindset. It uh, hopefully results in stronger feedback loops to align the learnings and the skills needed with the purpose-driven businesses that are required. It fosters the broader partnerships at all levels to tackle these broader issues. Yes, we do need that profound shift in leadership, in management education, as much as we need it from the leaders of business itself. It's great to see that we have three days with incredible speakers to talk about this, to hopefully get some ideas, to energize ourselves as we start 2022. It's very clear that the future of capitalism, the future of humanity, and the future of the planet actually depends on it. Now is the moment, and frankly, we don't have an alternative. Thank you again for what you are doing. Thank you for the opportunity to address you. And I certainly hope that you will enjoy the discussions we're having today. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are going to start our next session soon where you'll be able to hear from Paul in conversation with Mark Benioff, the CEO and founder of Salesforce. Stay tuned. But anyway, good to see you again after an exhausting week in Glasgow. And I really appreciate the uh, energy and passion that you showed there. It looked like you were in every event. So it might be good to start a little bit with your takeout. I know it was your first COP, but uh, why were you there? Why do you think it's so important that, for business to be there? And what was accomplished? Well, Paul, I, first of all, I want to thank you because this is not your first COP and you have been working so diligently for many years uh, for the benefit of the world. Um, not just as the CEO of Unilever, but also in your kind of post-CEO reality that, you know, I track so closely with you and I want to thank you for everything that you're doing for all of us. And I uh, know how instrumental you've been in so many COPs uh, from Paris to Glasgow. So thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, but now you have to answer my question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, for me, it was exactly like you said, it was my first COP and it was you know, very powerful experience for me to see so many people coming together with really the same focus, which is how do we create a net zero world? You know, how, how do we move to a world where uh, emissions, well, that this is not as a um, major issue, you know, uh, a place where I spend a lot of time, the big island of Hawaii, we have a volcano called Mauna Loa. And Mauna Loa is a place where a scientist from Caltech, which is a University of Los Angeles, went to in um, 1958. And he set up some equipment that shot a laser beam up into the sky every night, and it measured the CO2 in the atmosphere. And that's today what we call the Keeling curve. And you've seen it, it goes up and to the right. 
It's the amount, it measures the amount of CO2, Paul, in the atmosphere. Okay. And it's why we went to Glasgow, because since he went there in 1958, it has been going up. Yeah. And there's many questions about why does it continue to go up? And what can we do to get it to come back down? And uh, I think that a lot of those discussions were happening at COP. And, you know, I, I, was, I, I think it's very important and we, we have a lot of work to do. Yeah, many say, uh, Mark, that um, perhaps COP was more from the political side than we could have hoped for, but fell well short of what the science is asking for. And uh, why is it so important that business really participates in this, like you did with Salesforce and joined the race to zero and many of the other great initiatives? Well, I think that for number one, and I think for Salesforce, the, the first and most important thing we have to do at our company is be a net zero company with no new carbon emissions, and also to be fully renewable, which we are, and also to make more cuts to our emissions. So we're already a net zero company. And uh, as we enter the Fortune 100, this is very important for us. That, that's number one. Number two is, and you know, uh, several years ago, I founded something called 1T.org, the focus on a trillion trees, because we've now deforested our planet from six trillion trees to three trillion trees. Every trillion trees, Paul, sequesters 200 gigatons of carbon. Um, that means we've already emitted 600 gigatons of carbon just by deforestation. Compare that to the amount of emissions that have been released through fossil fuels, which is about 100 gigatons. So, we have a very serious issue uh, that we not only need to reduce emissions, but we must sequester carbon as well. And so we need to plant a trillion trees and we need to nurture nature. No. And the third thing is we need new solutions. And, you know, I'm in the technology business, so I am an entrepreneur, you know that. That's how we connected originally. But I, you know, see these amazing ecopreneurs. Many of them were at COP. These are people who are innovators, creators, building businesses in many cases, using technology from what we call the fourth industrial revolution, you know, things like the cloud, artificial intelligence, satellites, robotics, um, even, uh, even biology, to look at ways to address this issue that we're going through. And I continue to focus on these three areas, which is one, how do we all be net zero? Two, how do we plant a three in trees? And three is, how are we going to create an ecopreneur revolution that creates what we call a carbon market? That is, we, we need this carbon market. And I think this is one of the most important things that came out of COP yeah. is we're starting to see standards emerge that will let these ecopreneurs sell, if you were, will, with us a standardized mechanism, this incredible uh, uh, capability to uh, sequester carbon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, um... Sustainable standard board actually was a good thing because we get standards, but also what they called uh, the rule book, Article 6, in terms of the uh, carbon markets itself that has to develop. I was very pleased to also see uh, the $130 trillion from the financial community, the, the Glasgow Financial Alliance on Net Zero. You think that's real or is that uh, bank PR? Well, I think that you've got a couple different things going on and our friend Mizuno-san, who's both on the B team with us, but is a close yeah. friend of mine who lives in uh, Tokyo and is currently in Singapore right now. I, I would say that, you know, he was instrumental in creating what they call this $100 billion facility that will encourage um, developing countries to um, participate in this uh, revolution that we're talking about, which is to Keep, keep global emissions down. Yeah. And uh, they're going to need some financial incentives to encourage them to do that. So I think this is extremely important. And I was also excited to see so many of the financial services CEOs there making these types of commitments. But I was surprised, and I wasn't at the previous COPs like you were, that these CEOs, people that we work with every single day, have not been included in the conversation. Because in my world, Paul, I think that only through a multi-stakeholder dialogue are we going to create the consciousness needed to achieve the goals that we all want, which is a net zero world, okay. to plant the trillion trees, to create the ecopreneur revolution, to create the carbon markets. This is many stakeholders working together. 
And it's not just government, it's not just CEOs, it's not just activists, it's not just innovators, it's not just entrepreneurs, it's not just everyone. It's the idea that together we come together as one humanity, that we're not separate, we have to be together. And we're not separate from nature either, that we are nature. And we need to remember that we're connected to nature and that this is an incredible part of who we are and lose our separation that occurs between ourselves, but also between the planet. So we can find the solutions to elevate uh, to a higher place. Yeah, I agree with that. That was the whole spirit of goal 17 from the sustainable development goals, this partnership for the common good, you know, the solving these issues at a higher level than they were created. And they're of such magnitude now, and we need to do it in such a short period of time. What we found as well is that I at least got the sense that in many areas, the business was ahead of, uh, of, of the governments and that some of the government legislation or per for subsidies that we see really get in the way you you have mentioned a few times these nature-based solutions and and your trillion three initiative is probably the biggest one we have globally what would you say to businesses in terms of you know get nature-based solutions in your in yeah. your business model 45 trillion dollars you know directly depends yeah. on nature. so what's yeah. the message you would give them such a good question and i'll just tell you a funny story but you know, I live on the ocean. I love the ocean. You know, I live in San Francisco. The waves are crashing, you know, beneath my house every day. And uh, I love to be in the water. Yeah. And, you know, I've been through the South Pacific very extensively and also other places in the world. And uh, so I was always trying to take care of the oceans. And then when I realized that when we look at some of the major issues in the ocean, which are things like overfishing or, um, things like creating marine protected areas and conservation, but also reducing acidification, which is that the ocean is our biggest carbon sink. It's 20,000 gigatons of carbon in the ocean, 3,000 in the soils. And as I already mentioned once, 200 gigatons per trillion trees. So when we look at these carbon sinks in the world and how we're interoperating with those carbon sinks with the amount of emissions that we're creating, um, I found myself at a climate conference in San Francisco several years ago now, sitting across from Jane Goodall, who we all know, one of the great, greatest people on our planet. And she is on the cover of Time Magazine here. My favorite magazine, by the way, Paul, just so you know. And, you know, I was saying, oh, Jane, this is what I'm doing for the oceans. And she said, but what are you doing for the trees? And it really hit me in my heart. And that is where 1T.org came from and the trillion trees, because I went on a quest to think about what are we gonna do? And I bumped into this research that came out of ETH University in Zurich. And it brought, was brought to my attention by my head of ocean research, but also by Al Gore at a meeting that I was in with him in 2019, which was in Zurich. And actually it was in Geneva, now that I'm thinking about it. And we're there and we're in Switzerland. And he's like, have you seen the work of Tom Crowther? And I said, no, I have not seen Tom Crowther's work. Well, you have to read this paper. Well, now all of a sudden, several people started to send me this information said, you must look at this research. And what it said was, if we put a trillion trees on the planet and it wasn't just some you know, empty claim, he had used artificial intelligence to map out exactly where they should go, the types of trees, how they should be planted, and also that we need to conserve, we need to provide resilience, and we need to plant. We need to do many things to create this trillion trees and really deliver the mathematical proof that this was important, part of the total solution. Look, it's not just one thing, it's yeah. many things. You know, it's 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 gonna be nature, it's gonna be trees, it's gonna be how we're working with the oceans, with the soils. It's also going to be our behavior. It's also going to be what we're doing with our companies. So all of these things have to come together to make this work. Yeah, and the WEF, uh, I think that's well said, Mark, because the WEF estimated the other day that about $45 trillion of nature services is directly in businesses. And, you know, we, we just depend, as you said, anyway, it's not even a question to put a number on that. We depend on nature. And then Jane- Oh, we absolutely do. But there's things we can do, Paul, like, yeah. I just invested in this amazing company called NCX. And um, 
you know, they ha- they're an amazing company. And what they have used, done, they also use artificial intelligence to, you know, uh, basically they have biometricians who are on their staff who are able to quantify the amount of biodiversity through satellite images and drones and convince landowners who are cutting down trees to not cut down trees, but to grow trees and to grow biodiversity and let old forests nurture and expand and, you know, this rich ecosystem to, to continue. And then to using these new COP26 standards, deliver that into carbon credits that allow companies like mine or others in my industry to uh, go down the path of becoming net zero because we're planting more trees. They, those trees are actually sequestering uh, the carbon. We, through photosynthesis, the things we learned about, you know, in grade school, this is real. And um, it's a very scalable solution, the tree. Yeah, and it's the real one, as you say. We have, There's a lot of debate about net zero and offsets, but here you get to the real thing. That's why I like what you're doing. We should have a plug for Jane and because she's such a special lady, everybody should read her book, Hope, and uh, that that uh, would give you energy by itself. And despite uh, her battles her whole life, she still shows us it's possible and that it's the inner courage. Brings us to leadership, uh, Mark, because I had a, a thing that I was intrigued about because you're such a great leader and setting the example by walking the talk. I, I always have this sentence from Stephen Covey in my head, you cannot talk yourself out of things you've behaved yourself into. You're a great example of behaving yourself into an incredible leader. And um, But now I still see too many CEOs making scope one, scope two agreements, setting goals that they know they can achieve, but they know it's not enough, um, playing not to lose versus playing to win. And yet we know that we cannot afford that anymore. We can't play games with ourselves when the future of humanity is at risk, when we've already lost. 70% of the species, mammals, reptiles, etc. What does it take to become a courageous leader? And what is a courageous leader to you? And what message would you have to all these people that play right now, not to lose versus playing to win, which I know you do? Well, number one is I have a lot of compassion for all those CEOs, because let me tell you that when I went to business school, which was in 1982 to 1986, I have an undergraduate business degree from the University of Southern California, Los Angeles, a very high quality school, we didn't study sustainability quality. It wasn't part of the business. And as I grew up in other companies and my own company, it's not as if I understood some of the fundamentals of carbon math that we just talked about. So moving the whole business community along this journey so that they could understand the actions they need to take to reduce emissions and to become net zero companies, which is the first step, wow, this is going to be a real challenge. And I have a lot of compassion for that. Number one is, yes, we all have to agree to become net zero. And since you evoke Stephen Covey, we have to begin with the end in mind. So that's probably a phrase that he said that was very important to me, that setting our intention is probably the most important thing. Now, can I tell you, Paul, that when I started Salesforce 22 years ago, my intention was to be the net zero company that we are today? No. Today, is that very important to me? Yes. Is it very important to me that we have the trillion trees? Yes. To create the ecopreneur revolution, to create the carbon markets? Yes. These are my intentions. So now, um, yes, I'm trying to attract everybody in to work with us. And I think we need to do a lot of evangelism, education, motivation to move people along this path. And I'll tell you the large company CEOs that we deal with, we can be somewhat frustrated with them at times. But Paul, we also need to be thinking about these small and medium sized companies, because for them to become net zero is going to be a tremendous challenge. And we need to build new kinds of automation and technology and capabilities to bring them into this emerging carbon market. So that that is also very much on my mind and technology will be important. You know, I just invested in, I mentioned one company on CX. I just invested in another really interesting company called Loam Bio, it's in Australia, and it's a company that's making a fungus, and that fungus can be tilled into the soil to make the soil much more carbon absorbent. It can also be fed to cows to make the methane that they're being produced reduced. Why that's important is, can you imagine if you're a farmer today and you're building crops and that's your main product, if you had a second 
product that you could then trade, which was the carbon that you're absorbing through the huge amount of soil that you're maintaining. That's very exciting. Yeah, yeah. No, and you mentioned the thing, uh, you mentioned the word methane. One of the good things was this 30% reduction uh, of methane that came out of Glasgow. We have to do it still. But but uh, John Kerry yesterday night was saying, I had not run the numbers yet, but just a 30% reduction in methane is the same as stopping all cars, all ships, all yeah. uh, airplanes in terms of the equivalent effect, obviously. I am so glad you mentioned that because you just triggered me. Now I have to give you another example. Right, tell me. <laughs> so there's another company, you know, and look, and I'm an entrepreneur, so I love supporting entrepreneurs, but now I love supporting ecopreneurs. And there's another company called Planet Labs, right, right in San Francisco. And Planet Labs is launching thousands of little tiny satellites. And we have a satellite going up next year called Carbon Mapper. You can read about it online. It's amazing. It's going to be launched with NASA. And it is a satellite that can read carbon and methane on the planet, exactly what is happening with it. Did you know that today, no. if there is a methane leak on a pipeline, we don't know that it's there, or meth a high methane you know, waste dump, we don't know it's there because we don't have satellites in the sky today that can read the methane. But Paul, next year, we'll be able to look and say, oh, here's all where the methane is. We need transparency. That's a word that you and I know very well from our business career because we don't get trust without transparency. But yeah. this idea that we can have transparency into the best place to store the carbon and the best place to reduce the methane leaks, that these are technologies, innovations, entrepreneurs that give me, like Jane Goodall said, hope. And I think we need to nurture them, invest in them, and really take care of them, mentor them, things that you've done very well with other CEOs. Because I'll tell you, Paul, I really, this is where I feel we're going to get a lot of uh, acceleration over the next couple of years and where I want to spend a lot of my time. No, and we appreciate that. I always say we need more leaders and trees. And we've talked about both of them now. But Elle is your best ambassador on this because Elle Gore was running around Glasgow talking about this monitoring technology because it also holds all of us to a higher level of um, accountability, uh, including the government. Well, so he has wanted this for a long time. Yeah. And the government has not, our government here in the United States, we have not delivered this for him. And um, I'm so glad that entrepreneurs are delivering it for him. And uh, I think there are, will be many types of technology to do this because we're going to set the stage. Because when you have that data, as you know, because this is how you ran your company so well, Paul, when you have the data, you can make these decisions. And this is really critical uh, for us. So I'm looking forward to having more of this data available. Yeah, absolutely. Plus, I like your comment on uh, SMEs because small and medium sized enterprises, because they're 85, 20 percent of the global economy and, and they don't always get into the discussion, just like we forget the indigenous people that I know you're passionate about as well, or the farmers. You know, we really have to think about uh, the real people on the ground where things happen. And sometimes we're a little bit high up with our discussions. And what I appreciate with you is you stay grounded in in real life you know you're you're a spiritual person at least from the long time that i know you already you've always had a a, a deeper uh, sense of purpose a deeper meaning you you study a lot of other different cultures you borrow and steal with pride from many of these religions why is that so important to you and has that been especially a help to you during the COVID uh, crisis that we're still going through so great question, and I think it's very much connected to everything that we've spoken about because, you know, since the early 90s, I've had an opportunity to try to nurture and enhance a mindfulness practice. And it certainly came in handy during the pandemic, but I needed other tools as well. I mean, uh, I mean it, it wasn't enough, but I would say that, you know, the more time I spend in mindfulness and meditation, and I've taught some meditation, and I encourage everyone to meditate a little bit and spend time. And I was with a friend of mine last week in London after COP, and he was telling me about mental health issues that he was having in a post-pandemic reality, and that he was having to seek out therapy. And my recommendation was for him to also encourage and bring in a mindfulness and meditation practice. And what I found is that as I expand my mindfulness and meditation, I become 
that ability to connect more easily with other human beings, yeah. to lose my separation, you know, to fight my ego back, but also with nature. And I think that the more that we can find ourselves one with nature, uh, we'll find ourselves more with our spirituality. And that's why I encourage people to get into the forest, to do what the Japanese call forest bathing, to get into the ocean, <laughs> do real bathing, to um, spend time uh, with each other. And uh, I believe that by connecting more deeply with each other, this can move everything forward. And that's why I was so happy to bring it back to our original conversation at COP last week that so many of my friends were there. I, I had never been to a COP and all of a sudden, I think a lot of us just were naturally attracted in and, and then we're all asking the question, how do we improve the state of the world? How do, you know, we all believe business is the greatest platform for change at COP. Politicians believe politics is the greatest platform for change. Entrepreneurs believe entrepreneurship is the greatest platform for change. Kids and the activists believe it's activism is the greatest platform for change. So all of this is, you know, motion for change. And I think this is really why I left COP26 in a very positive mood. That's good to hear. I think you had a high density of people that understand that uh, putting themselves to the service of others is also in their own interest, which is a ultimate form of leadership, if you want to, that probably created that uh, extra energy. I always like to quote uh, Mark uh, Hubert Reeves, who is this philosopher from Canada, who said uh, in one of his books that man is the most incredible species. He worships an invisible God, destroys a visible nature, not realizing that the visible nature he destroys is the invisible God he worships in the first place. And that's a realization that we all need to come to, to get to that higher inner force that we need to attack these tough challenges, as you call it. Why, why do you think do we still have to have the discussion on why purpose is important in companies and and the importance of purpose oh. for everybody? I, I, sometimes yeah. I wonder, you know, do we need to discuss this still? It's like climate change or ESG. But um, what what? How do you think about this? We do have to discuss it, and I'll tell you exactly why. And I mentioned it already. You know, I went to USC in eighty two to eighty six, and. Uh, you know, I'm 57 years old. And when I look back at what they taught me in business school, it's very simple. They said, now Milton Friedman says that the business of business is business and you need to maximize shareholder value. So you have a whole generation of chief executive officers. Here's one right here of companies who have been trained ingrained, you know, to say, this is what you will do. And this is all that matters. So this focus that we have on now E, S, and G, and uh, you know, environment and the sustainability and governance, well, uh, I would say that a lot of these things are new. Look, even in the areas of, I have a book right here, I'm reading fabulous, another one of my mentors, Billy Jean King, somebody who pioneered equality here in the United States, and quality is a very uh, important person. He says, yes. Billy Jean King, the tennis player, for the audience. Tennis player. Absolutely. You remember uh, her famous uh, uh, game against Bobby Riggs? Well, she's fought for equality, and great people here in the United States, like um, Patty Arquette and others, have fought for the equality of pay, for example. We saw it with the U.S. women's soccer team. Well, gender equality, making sure that men and women are paid equally for equal work, we didn't learn that in business school. Yeah. There was no focus on making sure your pay scales are equal. That's another example. It's related, but it's actually quite similar, Paul, that there's things that are extremely important in business, like in the world of equality, where we do need to have a focus on equality in our businesses, gender equality, LGBTQ equality, racial equality. We have to look at how are we treating people in business? So when we think about how are we treating our employees or all of our stakeholders in business, how are we treating the environment um, and with sustainability? How are we building trust into our companies or with, you know, through our whole organization and ecosystems? Paul, these are not the words that I grew up with. They are not in the business books that I read growing up, nor the ones that you did. And while you got that leap at Unilever and found that a company must have a purpose, Many CEOs, this is still new because they have not heard these messages. 
And this is still new. And so what I hope is that as the next generation of CEOs come up or the one after that, and as business schools retool, re-educate people to include the environment and equality into their fundamental uh, curriculums, well, that we, we enter our businesses with this in mind, that we begin with the end in mind, just like we said yeah. before. Yeah. That it's not something that we're adding at the end of our businesses. And look, I said sustainability was not a core value of Salesforce when we started. Equality wasn't really either. Service was. We were always a philanthropic organization. Maybe that's how we got more quickly to some of these areas because we had surrounded ourselves with all of these NGO leaders. But I'll tell you, Paul, I, I think we still need to evangelize and have compassion and realize a lot of what we're saying is very new to business leaders, and this is extremely important. No, that's right. I think still in many of the schools, the uh, MBA programs are little Milton Friedman's on steroids, as I call them. And Satish Kumar says as well, when he says, like schools like London School of Economics should be London Schools of Ecology. You have to teach ecology and economics. The running and the management go together. You cannot do one or the other. So I have a lot of sympathy for that in its broadest sense. And what we're advocating in our book, Net Positive, is really the collaborative um, uh, leadership instead of the competitive leadership. And um, my point is always that on the future of humanity, we shouldn't compete. There's enough areas we can compete on, but when it gets like climate change and uh, planetary boundaries, etc., which is the future of humanity, I think we're all very well served to work together. That's mm. uh, you know, the uh, as we come to the end, uh, Mark. The, uh, regretfully, because I can talk to you the whole day and yeah. it's a pleasure. But um, um, uh, two things really. Um, there are a lot of students uh, that will be listening from all over the world here to you. And um, so before you give a final message to them, I, I want to know, are you hopeful or are you optimistic or pessimistic uh, coming out of Glasgow about the future of humanity? I think I can guess the answer, but I think the audience wants to hear it from you. Well, I'm optimistic you know, and, and you've heard why. I've tried to make my case, you know, that look at the change that we're, we are making. You know, we are fighting a consciousness that we just did not have. We need to have compassion for ourselves. That did we really understand that when that laser beam first went off on Mauna Loa, you know, in 1958, what that meant? You know, I, I am not sure that the world knew at that point what it really meant. So here we are 50, 60 years later. And yes, we need to move and we need to, we need to become net zero. We need to plant our trillion trees. We need to innovate. We need to be, all become ecopreneurs. We need to create our carbon markets. Look, there's very specific things that we can do to make a difference. This is important. We know we have our, we, we're beginning with the end in mind. We have our intention, our vision. We know what we want. We want a net zero world. We know what's important about that you know, a world that realizes, look, it's a world of finite resources. We can't act as if it's infinite. Yep. And we have to create a world about sustainability. And we all have to work together. And we need the collaboration and the communication and the innovation, and even the focus on equality that I mentioned, so that we can all get to the world that we want to get to. And each of us has to be that example. I hope that Salesforce is that example as we go into the Fortune 100 this year of a company that is doing exactly that. We're not making some future promise in those areas that we, we're making those changes. We'll continue to advance, of course, and but everyone can do this. And I think every CEO needs to advance their own awareness about what's going on in the world. And the, look, the, the past does not equal the future. And we can also look at as we're entering this post-COVID reality and as we're accelerating into it, that the world is different. So let's make these changes and let's go forward and let's do it with, uh, let's do it, uh, with as much energy and enthusiasm as possible. What's the final message to the students? If you could tell them one thing, what would you tell them? Your biggest lesson in life? I think the most important thing in life is to love yourself. Uh, to love others, um, allow them to love you, and love the planet, love nature. My father 
you know, so some of his last words to me were enjoy your life and enjoy nature, love nature, love yourself. This is what it ultimately is all about. And if you can do this, um, everything else will come to you exactly as you want it to. Well, thank you, Mark. We love you. We love what you're doing. The love example, you too, Paul. example you said with Salesforce and uh, being the leader you are. So thank I'm you. Privileged to call you my friend and really enjoyed this. Thanks. It's always, always wonderful to be with you. Likewise. Thanks, Mark. Thank you so much to Mark and Paul for joining us for that conversation. We will be back in a moment with our next session, a panel discussion on the future of leadership. Stay tuned. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all. Uh, and welcome to our uh, panel on the future of leadership, where it all starts, like Paul Polman was actually saying. Um, I just wanted to share a few thoughts on the topic of leadership before introducing our panelists. Uh, I think it has become more and more important for leaders to, one, be purpose-driven. As a leader, you should certainly clarify your own purpose, understand what drives people in your organization, frame an organization purpose that works for you and the people around you and obviously walk the talk and aim at making a positive change for society and, and planet to identify adaptive challenges not just technical challenges uh, which the organization can probably identify and solve by itself and by adaptive challenges i mean challenges that call for changes in attitudes and habits ways of doing ways of thinking a leader should help the organization tackle these adaptive challenges by empowering others and helping them take responsibility. Three, embrace imperfection. And it's difficult. Accept to be imperfect, vulnerable, human, and encourage people around you to do the same. And four, uh, run the organization and make decisions with both your head and your heart. Uh, let me turn now to our uh, distinguished panelists who are or have been CEOs of very large organizations and have led their organization in a purposeful manner, and they will share their personal and leadership journeys. Uh, I'll start with Angela Arendt. So, Angela, you started your career in the fashion industry in the US. You were the CEO of Burberry from 2006 to 2014 and tripled the value of the company. You joined Apple as senior VP of Apple retail and online stores in 2014 and 2019. And you are now a board member of several very large organizations, Airbnb, Ralph Lauren, and uh, WPP, one of the world's largest advertising, advertising companies. And you are also uh, the chair of Save the Children International, a leading humanitarian organization for children. You also describe yourself, which I really like, uh, on your LinkedIn profile as a loving wife, mom, sister, daughter, friend. Um, can I just ask you, um, Angela, to share one or two, one or two important leadership attributes that you think uh, a leader should certainly embrace um, in this uh, new area of, um, of leadership? Sure, and I think, uh, I think the key word in the question is leading and, um, and really what is leadership? What do you believe it is in your heart? And, and I've always felt that leadership was to mentor and to serve and to, um, to inspire and to unite. And, um, and so if you believe that, then I think one of the most important attributes for um, all leaders, but especially leaders of tomorrow, is very high EQ. I think that for years we relied on IQ, but I think the future, um, especially with high growth companies and a virtual world that we're all leading in today, um, I think the ability to listen and to feel and um, to then use your instincts to respond, I think are just, um, vital because you must build a foundation of deep, deep trust. 
And I don't think that you'll be able to do that unless you come in with tremendous EQ. Thank you, Angela. I'll turn to you, Loïc. So Loïc uh, Muto joined uh, Mars, uh, the US-based uh, uh, global pet care food and confectionery family-owned company in 1995 and held uh, finance positions in different geographies, Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, uh, EMEA. Uh, Loïc, you became general manager of Mars Switzerland in 2005 and Mars Pet Care Germany in 2008, you have been with Wild Canal since 2013, initially regional president in the Asia Pacific before becoming CEO in 2014 and a member of the Mars Pet Care leadership team. Wild Canal is a Mars company. It is a global leader in pet health through nutrition, um, which distributes its products through specialized channels. And it is also a multi-billion company that grows um, at a double digit rate and which has embraced purpose um, to improve uh, the health of every cat and dog. Can I ask you the same question as to Angela, Loïc? Yes, uh, hello Nadia, thank you. And first, let me say that uh, I have been a big admirer of Angela Aaron's work that has been a big inspiration uh, for what I'm doing today. Obviously, fashion and, and pet food is very different, but uh, a lot of the work she has done has, has inspired us in, as well in our strategy. So. And not to be redundant, um, I, I totally agree that you know the values of leadership are more leaning towards EQ. And if I can uh, maybe uh, narrow on, on two things that I at least I've learned or I've learned to become is really around empathy and inquisitiveness, if you want. So I, I really think that at least the higher um, I've grown up in the organization and, and even more with the context we live in today where you know, there is a lot of complexity, a lot of, of volatility in the environment. Uh, having an attitude of inquiry, of seeking to understand, uh, and, and really uh, displaying empathy uh, across the organization, um, within your organization, but as well with the stakeholder around the organization, uh, becomes a clear attribute in a sense that um, one of our job as leader is to make sense of the world in a way and to be able to, you know, orchestrate a, a game plan in, you know, inspire, but organize the organization, uh, you know, to, um, uh, to create value uh, for, uh, for the, the community, the industry or the ecosystem we play in. And, and actually, I, I do believe those qualities can be learned. Uh, we learn IQ a lot at uh, school and university. Uh, we can practice EQ and, and especially uh, inquiry and, and empathy is something you can really learn to develop uh, in, uh, in, uh, along your career. So it's not uh, something you get necessarily born with, but you can, uh, you can really practice. And it, it's really inviting others into your journey uh, to, to contribute, basically. And you know, the, the, the word you use, Nadia, initially on uh, you know, being adaptive, but as well you know, uh, building a kind of, uh, you know, coalition and empowerment inside the organization. And I think this, this attitude is, is really a, an interesting development. I'm not saying it's easy necessarily, and I'm not saying that every day I am like that as a leader, but certainly I think it's very powerful for the future. Thank you, Loic. And I think it's a good advice for the business schools to also rethink the curriculum and to embed uh, empathy, EQ, uh, you know, uh, in the way we, we also teach uh, business. Um, last but not least, Denis uh, Machuel. So, uh, Denis, you started your career at Schneider Electric, specialized in energy management and industrial automation, and then worked at Altran for 16 years, a world leader in engineering and R&D services acquired by Capgemini in 2019. Um, you spent 16 years at Altran, becoming CEO, becoming CEO of Altran Technologies. You joined then Sodexo in 2007, and occupy different roles, business roles um, in terms of benefits and reward services, personal home services, as well as functional roles in the digital space. And you became CEO of Sodexo in 2018. Um, and uh, Sodexo is actually at the top of its industry according to the Dow Jones Sustainability indices in terms of responsible practices. You left recently while joining the board of director of Kindrill, a spin-off of IBM that provides technology services. I'll have the same question uh, for you, uh, Denis. <laughs> Thanks, Nadia, and very happy. Hello, everyone. Very happy to be with Angela and, and Loic and yourself. 
on on what what I believe is a very important topic. Um, I wouldn't change a word to what uh, you said, Angela, and what, what you said, Loic. I think uh, I'm absolutely aligned. I, I would just add that um, I think leaders um, need to be anchored, anchored in very strong convictions. Convictions, as Paul Pullman said, that uh, you know capitalism is, as we know it today, has just gone too far, and that we need to reinvent it. Um, so we've, we've got to be absolutely anchored in these convictions. And we also have to be courageous because some of the things that you've got to do might be unpopular uh, on the short term. Um, so the courage is necessary when you face uncertainty. And I think leaders, and you, you mentioned that also, Nadia, when you talked about vulnerability, I think leaders need to be able to say, I don't know, because really the road that we have ahead of us is unknown for, uh, you know, in a lot of dimensions. So being able to listen, as you said, Angela, being able to be to have empathy, as you said, Louis, uh, will help us to open ourselves. Um, um, say, I don't know when you don't know. We don't need to have the answers. We'll find the answers in a collaborative way. Um, so, and, and fundamentally, when I'm talking about being anchored, I also mean, and um, Mark Benioff was saying that earlier, um, if you transform, uh, if you want to transform the company, you've got to transform yourself. And ha having this inner journey, uh, and meditation is, is, by the way, a great, great, great way to, uh, to know yourself. If you want to inspire others, um, it has to come from within. I think it doesn't, it can come from, come, come from the brain, but it also has to come from within. Thank you, Denis. And we'll actually, um, the next question is actually uh, your inner journey. I, I would love to understand um, what has been driving each of you throughout your professional professional journey. And if there has been maybe any turning point that made you look at things in a different way. Um, and maybe we can start with Angela. Yeah, I think... Um... I think there's always pivotal moments, no matter where you are. In Burberry, it happened to be 2008 when, uh, you know, the markets were collapsing. Uh, um, you know, at Apple, there were, there were again, similar moments and, and with Save the Children, I think it's the most pivotal of all right now because the entire sector has lost 10 years of work in one year due to COVID. And and so I think that you learn a lot in a crisis and you learn that you're in a leadership position for a reason and that everyone is looking to you to guide them and to unite them and to um, to maybe do things that nobody individually has ever done before. But that collectively, if you do, you could make a tremendous impact. And, and, you know, in the case of Save the Children, I'm only chairing it. The CEO was relatively new before COVID, and, but we just decided to pull the team together. You can't fix this in one year. It's going to take three years, but we challenged ourselves to triple our impact. How do we do that? And that's not just by raising three times the funds. That's by working three times more efficiently, leveraging technology, working with more partners, um, putting, embedding more local programs in place. And so, but it's been so inspiring. The team has just come together. The 28 members around the world have come together because they know that together, maybe we can and we will triple our impact. But if you didn't have this crisis, then it, it's not one of those you know catalytic moments that brings everybody together. But but I think as the leader, you need to put out there what the mission and the purpose is, and then you know in the most collaborative, inclusive way, unite everyone to come together and to own a big piece of that. And 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 that's just an example of today. But but I think that in every every few years, you're going to have those opportunities. Can I maybe just ask you, Angela, what uh, motivated you in the first place to join this organization? Uh, was was it something that obviously it's it's a beautiful organization, but is it something that you have been wanting to do for a long time? Is it something that 
Yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a really, really great question. You know, I've been raised that to whom much is given, much is expected. And I don't believe in retirement. I believe that we learn things every step on the way to continue to, to use our gifts and our skills. And, and I just felt that I, as I was exiting the corporate world, um, maybe there was an opportunity to leverage my 40 some odd years of leadership and, and strategic turnarounds, if you will. And, 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 and what if I, and I, yes, I've always had a passion for children. I believe that if you lean into something that truly breaks your heart, that it continues to motivate you going forward. And children have always broken my heart, the situations that so many are born into. So, so yes, I've kind of always put it out there into the ether a little bit. And, and as I left the corporate world and took a small break and saved the children called, I thought it's perfect. It's a calling and it's something I can pour my heart and soul and, and really truly give back you know, Thank so much you. what I've been given. Thanks. Loic, you want to go next? Uh, yeah, well, for me, it was, um, it was more very early on in my career. The question was where to go. I was really soul searching on the meaning of life, I guess. Um, and I was very interested in, in culture, in politics, in journalism, uh, you know, very different uh, options. Um, and I was uh, very fortunate that actually through an internship, Mars uh, sent me in, uh, in Poland in the 90s, where after the fall of the wall, many FMCG companies were investing a, no a lot there. Um, and I guess, you know, we, we settled in, uh, in Sorachev, which was about uh, an hour from Warsaw in, a, in a, you know, a, a, an economically deprived region. Uh, and I saw the impact that our business has had over 18, 24 months of uh, of being there on the community uh you know it was a small city and you know it's not necessarily uh huge by any mean but it made a real difference uh, unemployment dropped from 20 to 4 percent we started to rebuild roads uh, you know created hotels we needed like you know dozens of suppliers to operate our factories uh it, it was really fascinating and you know mars has a is a very interesting value set a core set of principle as a company it's a family business so for me the realization was simply well if i'm good at this uh, and i think if a business with good values is well run can have this kind of impact then maybe that's what i want to do in life uh, and you know since then so i i, I would say uh, very early on i had this feeling an intuition that business could be transforming and creating value when it was well run. Uh, you know, and don't take me wrong, uh, Mars is not an NGO. Uh, it, it is a for-profit organization, but with an ethics and, and with, with principles, with a value set and with a very clear notion that a sustainable benefit needs to be a mutual, a mutual benefit over time so that this, all the stakeholders in your chain needs to benefit so that they stick with you and, and, and they really uh, develop the, the, the business uh, and the eco economic value with you. So for me, that was my my uh, my revelation in a way, and uh, and uh, I, I didn't regret that, and that's why I, I spent twenty eight years now uh, working for the same company. <laughs> Thanks, Loic. Denis, do you want to share your personal story as well? Yeah, I, I think there, I don't think there was one turning point. There's a series of of moments where things have, have I think grown uh, internally and. Uh, um, one of them being, you know, when I started my career, I was very happy to develop, you know, a good business with good clients. But I felt very quickly that that was not enough. I was not fulfilling. And I remember that moment when one person on my team came and told me, I feel useless. And that was hard. That was hard. And I, I took that as a, as a signal that had to do much more than uh, having people that were doing a good job for clients. That my role was to help them blossom. That my role was to help them grow, uh, develop their employability, uh, uh, have themselves a sense of fulfillment. And as my career evolved, uh, that responsibility has, has become a big purpose. And uh, joining Sodexo, which is a great company that has a great purpose as well, was, was another step um, to embark into uh, a greater purpose. Uh, but any other, at the end of the day, what I strongly believe is that my purpose, and I think the purpose of, of, of many leaders, is to ensure that we put 
the men and women at the center of our preoccupation, that we put respect and humanity at the core of the ecosystems we live in. Um, I mean, we are a society of people. We are, we all together, and as Paul and Mark said, we are we are humanity. We have to put humanity at the core of, of what we do. And that's a great purpose. <laughs> Thanks, Benian. So we've we've been discussing a little bit your your calling, your inner journey, and uh, your own purpose. And it'd be quite interesting to understand, you know, what is uh, the purpose of the organization uh, that you have led. And as as um, Paul Polman was uh, reminding us, you know, we define purpose as um, not as a. It's not the, the the objective of purpose is not to maximize a profit. It is to create profitable solutions to the problems of people and planet um, and not to profit by creating problems for people and planet. Um, so it's really the, the, the company's fundamental reasons for being that goes beyond profit. Um, so I, I, I'd love to understand, you know, how you would express the purpose of your organization and if you could also share the, the innovative ideas, solutions that you have developed to respond to that purpose um, in a way that um, somehow improved the, I would say, the well-being of, of the ecosystem of your organization while also um, generating uh, improved performance for your organization. Denis? Yeah, thanks, Nadia. I think, uh, you know, I spent uh, 14 years with Sodexo. Sodexo is a great company with a fantastic mission. The mission is twofold, improving the quality of life of the people we serve and of our own employees and um, ensuring this economic, social and environmental development of the communities wherever Sodexo operates. So that's, uh, and that mission has been live, I would say for the past 50 years. It was created at the very beginning of the foundation of Sodexo. So that, that's, that of course gives you already a great sense of purpose. What I saw as uh, an extra responsibility for me as a CEO was to um, ensure that Sodexo would be a trailblazer of this new era of capitalism, uh, that we could scale models that reinvent um, you know, the, this, uh, this new capitalism that we highly need. So maybe a few examples. Uh, one, of course, was um, to you know, we decided to exit coal. Uh, but the interesting thing, and what I said earlier, which say, you know, things are not easy. When we decided to exit coal, the employees that that we had, and we, we, we will do it progressively, so next we will do it progressively. But when I decided that, people came to us, our people say, hey, what about us? Because the, probably the mine will, you know, Sodexo serves food uh, at the mines. And they say, what will happen to us? Because the way you do the business is quite virtuous. You respect us. So what, what will happen to us? So those are typically things where, you, you know, you take a, a decision that, that, makes, that makes sense. But you have to have a a broad view of the consequences of your decision. So that's, there's not no easy path. Second, second thing that, uh, that I've done is I've, you know, we've launched uh, and developed the, the largest program in the, uh, in the history of our industry on the fight against food waste. You might know that, uh, you know, one third of the food that is produced on earth is wasted. And if, if food waste were to be a country, it would be the third largest country in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emission after China and the U.S. So, I mean, it's a massive issue. And uh, uh, the idea uh, on the fight against food waste was to embark, again, our ecosystems, our employees, of course, our clients, our consumers, our suppliers, um, you know, particularly with one idea, which was to value food as a precious resource. There are so many things uh, that we take for granted. And I think too, too often we take food for granted. But there are farmers 
who are, by the way, not paid enough in a way, um, uh, who who need to be valued. All you know, and uh, I mean that's typically uh, something where uh, Sudex has a great purpose and uh, where we need to move the needle. Thank you, Denis. Angela, do you want to share uh, also um, the purpose of uh, I don't know, either Apple or, or Burberry and, and what, what you did to actually drive the organization towards that purpose? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think Apple's incredibly relevant on this topic. I mean, but but I will tell you, no matter where I've been my whole career, I think if you lead with purpose, then then it's kind of the guiding light that creates the culture and unites everyone to do incredible things. But um, at Apple, you know, I used to say that I think it's always important to look backwards before you look forward. And Steve built an incredible organization. And and when you read and you study, he constantly said that that he told the retail teams that their jobs was to enrich lives. Um, and so, but what did that mean? And, and were they measuring it? And and so as I went around to the 140 stores my first six months, I would ask them, I would say, what's our purpose to enrich lives? Well, are we doing it? And they'd kind of look at me and give me little examples. So <laughs> I really felt that we needed to codify that and we needed to to not just have a qualitative, but have very quantitative ways to measure. So when we put together um, the new retail concept, which included the new in-store experience, or I just said we were actually just creating new software for the store. That is simply what the, in we treated the store as if it were a big Apple product. And so what was that software for the store? And and like everything else in life, I don't believe that I don't believe in this social world that you do things top down. So we did one what I like to think is one of the largest internal crowdsourcing exercises that we actually ask um, about 60,000 employees around the world in the 500 stores at that point in time. Over the course of the couple of months as we were developing the new experience, what did they feel Apple should be doing more of in their community? And they got together and, and fed it all online and we edited and curated and we got down to these five or six really big things. And we said, if we do those and we measure those, then we will know that we're actually enriching people's life. And one of those was education. And that, that was through Steve's lens as well. He, the retail teams were never allowed to sell. He said, every customer, you have to educate them on our products and tell them something they don't know. So they leave smarter about our products, et cetera. So through the lens of education, we created the entire new in-store experience to focus on those things that the employees told us were really important for their community. But most importantly, once we launched it and we invited the community into all of those 50,000 sessions every week to, around every store, they then got a survey afterwards. They used to get a survey if you get it repaired at the Genius Bar. Why shouldn't they get a survey if they attend a session? And they were asked a series of questions. And the final question was, do you feel by attending this session we have enriched your life? And so for the first time, um, and it was actually wonderful because Oxford heard we were doing it and reached out and, and wanted to understand how we were starting to measure um, the, the uh, I would say, again, the more emotional part um, of actually impacting someone's life. And, and, and we wanted to know, were we inspiring them to learn something new, knowing that a lot of people's jobs would be dislocated with machine learning and artificial intelligence, et cetera. Knowing loneliness is one of the biggest challenges in the world today. Did they feel more connected with people in their community when they were attending one of these sessions? You know, did we help unlock their creative thinking in, in some of the art areas that maybe, you know, they weren't as familiar with? Um, and so, so enriching lives, but I think saying it and embedding it into the daily operating model of an organization are two different things. And then if you're going to do it, then I think that you have to have the narrative around it. And that, that needs data, both qualitative and quantitative. Thanks, Angela, and, and, um, and I'm, I well, completely agree. I think measurement is key, and I know uh, Loic uh, is, is going to talk about Roy Canin and, and, and hopefully he's going to make the point as well. We also do believe that at some point you have to measure purpose. You have to measure what change you are actually making in society. Uh, otherwise, it's, it's very hard to know if you are even actually moving in the right direction. 
Um, Loic, do you want to share the Wild Canyon story? Yeah, sure. With with pleasure. I mean, uh, we, you know, we are in a in a pet food or pet care industry, um, and an interesting thing is uh, when when Mars really recreated what we call segment. Uh, you know, pet care confectionery split it up. Um, you know, pet care really worked on actually its purpose. I mean, why are we here? What is this category about? What are we here to do? And what what was very interesting is is you know that our belief that you know pet makes a better world for us. I mean, people don't have pet to feed them; they have pet because it adds value to their life. Anyone who has a pet in their home, they know very well what kind of emotional value they get. <clears throat> Most human beings, I would say, all human beings are wired to care for someone, and caring for a pet is part of this process. And for any one of you who have teenagers. You know that usually you can go through teenage time in a much easier way when you have a cat or a dog at home. Uh, <clears throat> when your 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 kids are frustrated, they can to download to the to the cat and the dog. So there, there is a lot of scientific work around that. And so we really centered around uh, you know pets make a better world for us. So how do we make a better world for pets? And the way Wild Canine delivers on that is simply by improving health of cats and dogs through nutrition. Uh, and so you know. The, the beauty of having this this centricity around we are we are standing for cats and dogs health is it really um, uh, create a some kind of backbone in the organization it actually makes a lot of decision very easy easy I mean you 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 really looking at what what is the right thing to do first for the cats and the dog and I know it sounds trivial I'm talking to this audience uh, but it, it's actually a big difference in the way you look at your business and the way you design your activities. The, the first thing it does is you have to decenter yourself actually from uh, you know, the, the ecosystem you serve. So if you want to impact health of cats and dogs, you can't do it on your own. You can't do it just with your product. You need to involve veterinarians, breeders, you know, a, a lot of stakeholders around the pet owners. And so you, you start looking at what is their contribution? What is their level of satisfaction? Uh, are they happy in their job? Do they actually make a living? Uh, because we know that you know one of the big problems of pet ownership, for example, is that most people think they know their cat and dog. They don't because they can't speak, so they hide their pain. So you really need uh, professionals around you to be a responsible pet owner. Um, and so how do we make those professionals uh, thriving professionals? It's actually very difficult. Veterinarians is a very distressed profession in, in many ways. You know, there are a lot of issues with... Uh, in the profession. Breeders can hardly make a living sometimes. So really running around this course, so which goes way beyond making, you know, kibble, uh, if you want, is, is totally changing the way you look at your, at your industry, at your impact, at, at, at uh, what you're doing and the, the kind of strategies and activities you're designing for. Uh, the other thing it does is we, we shift it from output driven to outcome driven. So, you know, output driven is how much more do we sell this month? And the outcome is really looking at, are we having the impact we want to have? Are we designing our activities to, to solve the pain point in our ecosystem that, that, is, uh, that is really a, a source of suffering? Or if we remove that pain point, we will actually make the entire ecosystem healthier. I can give a, a, a few examples on that. We, you know, a few years ago, we, somebody, realize that actually 20% of a puppy litters actually don't make it, generally speaking. You know, they, they don't survive because they don't have enough strength to actually get to the, to the, uh, to the beach milk. It, it's as simple as that. So we, we did a lot of work to understand that. Uh, we developed a lot of science around neonatology. Uh, and we developed a, uh, a, both a diagnostic tool for the breeders that was enabling them to identify the weakest puppy the nutrition solution that was a, a milk replacement to make them stronger. Uh, and of course, a monitoring system to, to, uh, to, uh, to look at the progress. This is not, this is the kind of science you, de you develop and you know, these products will be used for a very short period of time, five years of research. You won't necessarily make a return on this uh, when, when you're launching this product, but you're solving such a big pain point for the breeder. Breeders hate losing puppies. You know, it's a big stress for them. So you solve that. Of course, you enter into partnership with them, and you you know you increase your reputation, you build up your credibility in that territory. It makes you legitimate 
for the start of life of puppies and kittens. So for you enter a very virtuous cycle, actually, and create value holistically uh, for all the stakeholders in it. Uh, another one is, is generally speaking, cats and dogs. You know, dogs. You know, people think about taking their dogs to the vet. Very few people think about taking their cat to the vet because. For anyone who has a cat, it's very complicated to transport. And when you arrive at a clinic, well, there are dogs out there. So the cats don't really like that. Uh, and what while can I look at? And remember, we're only making kibbles. Uh, so, you know, we, we looked at we looked at this problem holistically and say, why is this happening? So we, we interviewed a lot of vet practitioners and, and, and pet owners and basically decided to do something about this. And, and really for the care of the cat, we had to change the paradigm. And so we looked at educating cat owners on how to, 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 to understand the triggers, when they should go to the, to, the veter to the veterinarians, and how they can prepare this visit, how they can make it easier. So educate them for that, run campaigns for it. But we change as well the way the clinic reception is done. We totally redesigned the waiting room so that it was a better environment. Actually, the inside of the clinic separated the consultation room. What, how do you clean up the consultation room after a dog so that the cat doesn't feel stressed and so on and so on? So this has been really an entire program that we, we've, we've rolled out now around the world for many, many years to try to change that paradigm. Now, when we do that, it's what we call a win-win-win. So you, you improve the health of the animal. The, the owner has a better satisfaction. Veterinarians feel, feels better because they can provide better care. And of course, it creates value. Uh, hopefully, they will recommend our product as well at the end. So, you know, we we, we are not, uh, you know, we're not losing out in doing this, this activity. Now, the centricity around the purpose enables you as well to, to take challenges that maybe you would not take otherwise. And the latest example for us has been uh, our commitment on carbon neutrality by 2025, which is very bullish even inside the Mars standards. But the reason why we could do this is because our team was really, uh, you know, is taking it at heart that, you know, we have to be proud of our business. So when you are purpose-led, there are a number of things you need to do, and there are a number of things that you cannot afford not to do. And that was one that you cannot afford not to do. So we ended up really operationalizing our carbon neutrality uh, mission. Uh, for example, our commercial buyers were really identify and map the entire carbon footprint of all the raw materials we're using. We redesign our formulation software so that we could not only look at the nutritional value of the recipe, but as well the carbon footprint of them, so we can optimize for it. We actually adopted a carbon-adjusted PNL, meaning that we are introducing an internal fee of what of the cost of carbon for all of our operation and our entire, uh, if you want, normal financial system or productivity system doesn't only look at optimizing productivity for cost but includes the carbon element in it inter internally and and for me this is really the the, the benefit you have when you when you work with a purpose-led organization uh, you know people join you for that purpose of course they want a job of course they want to make a living but they are dear to your mission they will go an extra mile. They will be more bullish in terms of the, the, the challenges they take. And we will be looking at our, at our enterprise for the outcome and the impact and not only for the output. For me, it creates an incredible energy in the organization. And actually, you attract partners. You attract people who want to join you on that mission. So you make yourself bigger than you are in many ways. So I, I, I really value this. And it, it's, a, it's a fantastic um, you know, place to be when you can mobilize your organization behind a meaningful purpose. Thank you, Loïc. And I think it's, it's, it's actually a very important point because um, there was, um, so embarking the organization, as you said, because otherwise it's, it's just impossible to deliver on your purpose if you don't bring the organization on board. But there was a recently a survey by um, Egon Zander um, uh, in 2021, so this year, a CEO survey that showed that CEO actually, according to their teams, uh, struggled in um, actually relating to others effectively and authentically. So I, I think for many CEOs, it's still maybe hard to actually embark the organization with them um, because of this, you know, difficulty to connect in the end with, with, with the organization. I have a question for both uh, Angela and Denis. Uh, Denis. Uh, in relation with the role of board. So according to uh, 
um, a recent survey by PwC, 70% um, of the C-suite executives that were interviewed said our boards are not well prepared um, to navigate the climate and social transition. And nearly 75% uh, of them said that the board is not spending enough time on both climate and social issues. So, um, yeah, I, I'd love to have your, your perception of the role of boards as, as board members yourself in embedding purpose within organizations. Maybe Angela <laughs> and then Denis. Sure. Yeah, I think, I think that, um, I think it's interesting. I think that if you have a great CEO and you have incredibly passionate founders um, I think that you will find purpose as the foundation. And then I think it's simply the board's job to ask the right questions and, and you know, and, and in the different committees to make sure that, you know, that you're also pushing the leadership team, et cetera. Um, I don't think it's the board's job to come up with the purpose. I don't think it's, I think that if, if there is a board and there's a company that you feel there's the disconnect, then I would look at leadership first and challenge whether you have the right leadership. Um, because I think that great leadership today, they know that it had, and great founders today. I mean, you know, Airbnb's success has all been based on their purpose of belonging connecting people, giving people a place where they feel connected to other people. And from the day they founded the company, and even when they came out with all of their public documents to go public, they put all of their purpose and their beliefs front and center before anything else, because that's what unites their culture. That's what drives their hosts and their guests. And, and that's what drives the outcome of the financial success. So um, so I think it, as a board, that is the lens they see everything through. And maybe we remind them from time to time, but, but when it is the core and the foundation that a company is built on. So I think the bigger challenge is, is in existing companies that don't have it. And, and then what is the board's role? And actually, I don't think it's the, the, the board's job to embed it. I don't think it's the board's job to create it. But I do think it's the board's job to make sure that the leadership has it. It's embedded in the DNA. It's embedded in the culture. And it is the lens that every significant decision, environmental, social, um, is always run through. And, um, you know, we talked about apples enriching lives. We, you know, at Burberry, it was to protect. Everything was about protection. And the tagline was, how many lives can we touch and transform through the power of our performance? And, and, and we, sh we talked to the board about that up front. And, that, and the board agreed that 1% of the profits would go into the Burberry Foundation, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I think it's a really interesting. I don't, I, I'm, I get, it's tricky because being a CEO and having a great board, it's not, there's, it's not, it's the board's job to make sure things go through that lens, but that is leadership's job. And if they're not doing the job, then I think the board should, should challenge the leadership. Thanks, Angela. Denis? Yeah, I would second uh, Angela's uh, views, of course. And I would just say one thing, and you mentioned that, uh, Angela, is the question is how much time is spent by the board on those type of discussions? What I've seen so far is that, in many ways, uh, this is still a side topic where I think it should be central to strategies and central to really the reflections. The, the, the models that we have to build are still unknown for uh, you know, many of them. Uh, we have to invent new ways, new collaborations, new models, and, uh, and, and that requires um, I think intensive discussion so that people understand um, so that, you know, leadership can come up with uh, these ideas and be supported by the board. Um, I think board members also have a responsibility of uh, being educated on those topics, being aware, mm -hmm. knowing the complexity of, uh, and, and you know, Loic, you, you, you talked about uh, this carbon adjusted PL. They hasn't, I haven't heard of many boards that have been really trained into what exactly is a carbon-adjusted PNL and have seen the consequences of it and, and really understand 
uh, you know, what it means. Um, and, you know, today, the ultimate responsibility of a board member is vis-a-vis -vis the shareholders. Now, if we go away from a pure Milton Friedman approach, which is just optimizing profit for shareholders, and we talk about, uh, you know, a company being a multi-stakeholder uh, topic, there's something I think that we should reflect upon on the responsibilities of the uh, board members. How can you be a multi-stakeholder company and have a shareholder governance? Because ultimately, again, the responsibility of, of the board is towards shareholders. So I think there's some, something here uh, that we should reflect upon. Thank you, Denis. We have only five minutes left and we have a, a few questions. So I'll I'll take two of them. Um, so there is a question from Natalia who is asking if you could give an example of a tough, tough choice you had to make in order to stay true to your company's purpose. Uh, not an easy one. <laughs> uh, I don't know who wants to uh, take that question. And I, I'll read the second one so it gives you a little bit of time to think that through. <laughs> the second one is around um, concrete steps that uh, your uh, company uh, has taken to reduce income inequality. I can I can give a pass if and you know allow anyone to, to jump in. And and to Denis' point, I think one one place where the reconciliation in my view is, is happening is when you're looking at, at creating value in a holistic way. Uh, you know I actually don't think when you're purpose led you're less performing uh, you know financially uh, over time, I mean, you might have uh, you know lows and so on, but over time, actually, your your value, in my my view, is is going to be more sustainable over time. So you create a, a stronger, more resilient business, especially in current context, when you're creating value for all the stakeholders uh, around you in a in a relatively balanced way. To answer your question, one one example uh, actually is very topical. Like we talked about it this afternoon. Um, there was a point where you know. Clearly, you know, for example, in pet care, uh, we have a bit of an epidemic around obesity. Uh, you know, cats and dogs, like humans, are getting overweight, believe it or not. Uh, and we had to take the decision at some point to relook at our feeding guidelines. And, uh, you know, so what do we recommend people to feed? And one of the key uh, indication was acknowledging the fact that pet owners uh, are not feeding only the product you sell to them. They are actually, you know, using some treats, giving some leftovers here and there, and not accounting for that was basically building in an overweight in your feeding recommendation. Now, here is the trick. When you reduce your feeding guide recommendation, potentially, you lose volume. And so, you know, the, the, and so when you put that into a spreadsheet, it's scary numbers. You, you basically look at, at destroying massive value for your organization. Uh, I'll be being the right thing to do from a, a you know a health centric point of view. So, uh, you know, we went the long way to to actually make that call, uh, do the right thing, uh, educate owners uh, in in this way. We we uh, and we don't be, you know we didn't lose out by do, by being responsible. But when you look at it at face value, the numbers are absolutely scary, and you will you will never rationally, I would say, make that decision. On, on your second question. Um, I, I've joined Mars in the 90s, and from the 90s, Mars had a very clear grid <laughs> by job levels, what we call zoning system. And basically, you get the job, you get the zone. It doesn't matter where you are, who you are, if you're young, if you're old, if you're a woman, if you're a man. Uh, I remember being very young into a job and getting, so there is a pay scale within that zone, but it was, it was not linked to you, it was linked to the position. So that's one way of managing, uh, you know, uh, salary uh, uh, equity uh, or managing inequality. In the, on the other side, is you don't discriminate because you attach the pay scale to the job, and it's a public scaling system. So everybody knows it uh, in the organization. Creates relatively great transparency. Avoid a lot of negotiations mm -hmm. on what should be the package because it's basically standardized uh, across across the world. Thank you, Loïc. Denis, Angela, do you want to give, uh, share a few thoughts on either one of the questions? Or we are good? Angela, you want to go ahead or? You go first. 
Just, uh, well, I mentioned that earlier very quickly. When uh, when I decided to exit coal, um, there were two things happening. First, uh, as I mentioned, there were people who were, um, you know, impacted. And, uh, and of course, the top line was impacted, back to, back to uh, what Loic was saying, um, but also people. Uh, the people that would move away from Sodexo, maybe maybe be rehired by companies that would have, uh, you know, a different way of treating them, and that was that was a very hard decision to take. And the second thing was, I had people internally telling me, "If you exit coal, why why are we staying in uh, oil and gas? Why are you dealing with that industry or that or that other industry?" You know, and uh, again, you know making that decision that we, we do this, but not that, um, was, was, was not an easy one. But you have to make choices at a certain point. Yeah, and I think you have to revisit them constantly. Um, you know, at, at Apple, they would sell, you know, when I first started, we would sell product and then you would pay for um, a session to learn how to use that product. But when you're paying top dollar, it, it felt counterintuitive to me. And shouldn't instead we create an incredible um, in-store experience with many more opportunities to learn and, and get we had bigger societal problems that we were looking to also help make a dent in in these stores that 500 million people walked into every year. And, and so I think when you lift up and look at it, but it was a big number to stop doing that. And, and there wasn't necessarily the proven to offset it, the number of people that would be more loyal, that would lean into the services and then into the product. But we knew it was the right thing to stop doing it. And we walked away from it, but then we never looked back. Everything that the loyalty of the consumer and the appreciation for everything else that they could learn in a much more exciting and immersive way, it far made up for the one-on-one -on -one sessions that, that people had to pay for once they bought a very expensive product. So I think just when you do the right thing, you win. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you for your uh, incredibly valuable contributions. And um, I, I, I just want to uh, finish by, uh, I like quoting uh, uh, people uh, to finish a, a webinar. So I'd like to offer that quote by Lao Tzu, who is um, the founder of Taoism, an ancient uh, Chinese philosopher, who says a leader is best when people barely know he exists. When his work is done, his aim fulfilled, they will say, we did it ourselves. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, very you much. so much to our esteemed panelists. Uh, I would like to let you know that next up, we have a MBA keynote from an MBA candidate at the Oxford University. Stand by. So I would like to welcome to the stage Yumna Sergi. She is an MBA candidate at the Saeed Business School, University of Oxford. Prior to her MBA, Yumna worked as a technology consultant in the United States public sector, where she had a specific focus on cloud modernization for federal health agencies. She's currently an investment director with the Oxford Seed Fund, a student-run VC, and she's very passionate about using technology to create more financial inclusivity through entrepreneurship. She's also a first-generation Lebanese American and recently published a cookbook to raise money for humanitarian relief after the 2020 Beirut explosion. Welcome, Yumna. Thanks, Amanda. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. It's a privilege to be here today and to be sharing the stage with such an impactful group of leaders to be discussing a topic as important as putting purpose into practice. And it's been wonderful to follow the past panel we heard from where business leaders were identifying the specific ways that their organizations were working towards their long-term purpose objectives. My name is Yumna Sergi, and I am an MBA candidate at the Said Business School within the University of Oxford. During their discussion, Mr. Pullman and Mr. Benehoff mentioned that they didn't get the opportunity to discuss sustainability and purpose-driven business in their business schools, 
Um, so I'm glad to report that these are topics that are top of mind for myself and for my classmates in our conversations every day. I have a few stories and statistics to share with you all today, but my primary intention is to represent the viewpoint of myself, my classmates, and other early stage professionals, and to share our current outlook on the world of business leadership and the key things that we are looking for as we take the next step in our own professional careers. For the past three years, I have been working as a technology consultant in Washington, DC, supporting cloud modernization projects using technologies like Salesforce. So it is a special privilege for me to be able to share the stage today with Mr. Benehoff, and of course, with the other inspirational leaders that we heard from, including Mr. Pullman, Ms. Aranz, Mr. Moutolt, Mr. Makael, and Ms. Turfus. The past two years have radically changed the way that we operate as a business community. From the effects of the COVID pandemic to the Black Lives Matter movement and the increasing impact and concern we have over climate change, all of these factors have broken down the barriers between our professional selves and our personal selves. And I will never get tired of hearing a four-year-old running around in the background during a Zoom meeting but I do think there is a deeper opportunity here that we must take advantage of. Because we have been exposed to each other's personal values in a way that we never have been before in the workplace. Business leaders often emphasize the importance of being responsible or purpose-driven. And the investment community talks about standards such as ESG and the importance of those standards in making investment decisions. Yet, despite hearing these terms used more frequently, I'm often still confused on how organizations intend to change their business models to work towards these goals. I want to understand more than the fact that a business is purpose-driven. I want to see how they are targeting and defining specific purpose objectives and creating the robust operational changes needed to work towards that stated objective. So today I have three calls to action for business leaders on how they can move beyond the mention of a purpose-driven business and operationalize that statement. My first call to action is this. Business leaders should define a specific purpose objective and incorporate the language for that objective into the business's legal structure. This will facilitate its implementation and add more accountability to the process. And we have a great case study that we can look at to see how this has already been implemented. Anglian Water provides water services to 4.3 million people in the east of England. And it has won numerous awards for responsible business and has been recognized as an industry leader since the 1990s in shaping purpose-driven business. They commit themselves to goals such as achieving net zero carbon emissions, preventing the waste of plastic water bottles, and making water and sewage bills more affordable to end water poverty. And so they have clearly identified their purpose objective as trying to solve and reduce the ecological footprint of their operations. And they tie that to a societal value that we all share, which is to advance the environmental prosperity of our communities. But Anglian Water doesn't just stop there. In 2019, they became the first water company to include their commitment to reducing their ecological footprint into the company's legal articles of association. So this makes Anglian Water legally bound to uphold their values and ensures that they are consistently making progress towards their stated purpose. My second call to action for business leaders is to educate their stakeholders about their purpose objectives and its correlation to a wider societal value. And by stakeholders, I include employees, prospective job applicants, supply chain partners, customers, and investors. In a 2020 study on responsible business conducted across North America, Europe, and Asian markets, Nine in 10 consumers agreed that they would be more likely to support a brand if it had a strong and clear purpose. And 62% of those consumers 
said that it was important for that purpose to align to their own personal values. And so from this statistic, we can see that stakeholders are asking organizations to be more targeted and to be more specific. We want to understand what we are buying, where we are working, and who we are investing in. My last call to action is for business leaders to build out performance metrics that incentivize and reward employees who are contributing to the organization's larger purpose objectives. At the end of the year, employees are often rated using both quantitative and qualitative metrics to determine end of year bonuses, promotions, and overall performance. Quantitatively, we use numbers such as sales revenue generation or the number of new clients that someone has brought in as methods to evaluate performance. And qualitatively, we have an entire infrastructure to measure performance using methodologies such as the SMART goal tool to track progress. And so organizations should build out both quantitative and qualitative performance metrics that are specifically tied to their stated purpose objectives and evaluate employee performance at the end of the year using these metrics. This will create a shared understanding amongst all employees that they are being evaluated on stated metrics that contribute to the organization's greater purpose objectives. Once again, I refer to Angley and Water in my example. The organization created a set of 32 outcome delivery incentives, which rate a manager's success directly based on their contribution to the organization's larger goals. And these are things like increasing the capacity of sewage systems or improving the results of customer satisfaction reports that are coming from the Consumer Council for Water. And so there is a shared understanding that it is everyone's responsibility in the organization to work towards the purpose objective together. This creates a shared sense of accountability rather than leaving the mission of creating purpose just to the business leaders at the top of the organization. We continue to be taking enormous strides in increasing the positive impact that businesses make in their communities. And as I mentioned at the beginning of my comments, my hope is that what I am asking for today reflects my viewpoints and the viewpoints of other early stage professionals as we look to the leaders in business right now to help us define the direction for our own careers. Because the future of leadership depends on the actions of those who are in leadership right now. I don't want a business to just tell me that they are purpose-driven and neither do my classmates or colleagues. We want business leaders to show us how they are purpose-driven, tell us how they are operationalizing this statement, and most importantly, bringing us into the ring to join the fight. We are at a turning point in the way that the business community continues to evolve. And I know we don't have all the answers yet for how to operationalize the type of change that I am asking for. I think that's okay. Let's start by defining specific purpose objectives that we can control and that we can accomplish and figuring out a pathway towards their implementation together. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your call to action and your address. We greatly appreciate it. And thank you, friends, for joining us for day one of this year's Oxford Economics of Mutuality Forum. Tomorrow, we will turn our attention to the future of performance management. We look forward to seeing you and hope that you'll enjoy the speed networking option that will take place now. Have a fantastic day and thanks for being here.